In December of last year, the Chinese government suddenly abandoned its stringent COVID zero policies, which had been the strictest in the world for three years. After a sweeping outbreak of the pandemic and an estimated million plus fatalities, a grim cost paid. Many thought the economic downturn caused by three years of isolation and lockdowns would become a dreadful part of the past, too painful to recall. However, the stage curtains rose, unveiling an era akin to a Great Depression. Alongside it came the emergence of vast numbers of homeless unemployed due to soaring joblessness. Recently, a video circulated on Twitter showing a row of hammocks tied to trees along a roadside, with young individuals lying in them during broad daylight, while others sat by the road. The user who posted this stated it was in Shenzhen, and those in the hammocks were a large group of unemployed individuals now living in the streets. A video posted by a netizen on June 26th showed the once bustling pedestrian street of Shangxiajiu in Guangzhou now deserted, with many shops closed. The person filming stated, "It's now 6 p.m. In the past, this time would have been teeming with people." If not for witnessing this myself, I wouldn't believe this is Shangxiajiu. Many thought that post-pandemic, all sectors would boom, and it would be a time of prosperity. However, the harsh reality we see is a total economic downturn, with a large number of shops closing down one after another. Some pawn shops that managed to survive during the pandemic are now closing in quick succession after it ended. There are only a few pedestrians, he exclaimed. This situation is too eerie. On June 1st, Douyin blogger Sun Zhaoyue posted a video titled "Depression in Shenzhen and Shanghai." In the video, he talked about two incidents. First, he had a meal with an old colleague at Hong Kong Plaza on Huaihai Road, Shanghai. To his surprise, the usual bustling intersection was devoid of people. The second incident occurred during a business trip to Shenzhen. He and his colleague took a DD taxi to Futian District for a meal. The driver commented, "Shenzhen is finished. Look at this place in Futian where you are going for a meal. It used to be bright and bustling from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. with many people out and about. Do you know that now by 10 p.m. there's hardly anyone around?" As soon and his colleague wondered, "When will this end?" He felt that it was just the beginning. Recently. China's state media has been enthusiastically propagating reports about the struggling living conditions in Western countries. Xinhua reported that one seventh of people in the UK are hungry, and 25 percent of adults in the US are going hungry. Australia and Canada were no exceptions. Veteran China commentator Zheng Xuguang pointed out in the Free Asia Radio program Asia Wants to Talk that this is the state media's vaccination strategy. Even in a country like the UK, one seventh of the population can't get enough to eat. So if someone they know starves to death due to malnutrition, people will have a buffer in their minds. I think China's economy and food chain is in serious trouble. It's not about the concept of poverty alleviation in 2021. It's about the impending famine, he said. Ming Qiuzhen, honorary professor of the Department of Politics at National Taiwan University, added this in the program. Why do they need to vaccinate? Because they worry that China is about to encounter problems. This judgment, I think, is very accurate. It's a clear leading indicator. Oh, 第一次感受到找工作竞争压力那么大，乌泱泱全都是人排了一圈又一圈，进去都要排队，你可想而知里面有多少。工作二十天了，钱也用完了，有十天吃了包子为止。哎呀，厂也进了二十多个厂，进进出出，进进出出的，就是找不到工作。现在连回去的车位钱都没有，睡在公园呢下雨又不行，只有睡在大桥下面，睡在大桥下面才不才不会被风吹雨打。你看外面，外面那么大的风，还下毛毛雨，太冷了。实在没生活费的话，就叫父母寄钱过来。工资高的厂呢又要大学文化，工资低的厂呢又不想做，工资太低了，一个月都存不到存不到一千块。谁干啊？再过两天买包子的钱都没有了，一天还要喝两瓶水。他去找工作，那个酒厂的话，他现在到现在还不通知，有点着急。因为外面风好大呀
Hello， 我已经到家了。刚去找工作，他好多工作都是那种，就是要不卖衣服，要不卖鞋子那种。他大概的话是底薪是两千二，然后再加上两百块钱，今天两千四，然后再加上就是自己卖的那个提成。他们说一个月的话就有三千多，四千都不到吧。两件事接踵而来，有点承受不了。本来我之前还想着累一点辛苦一点都没关系，现在都等了一个多月，快两个月了，又来就去不了。我一点心理准备都没有，现在要怎么办啊？真的现在生活太难了，连个厂都不要我。工厂的人都走完了，还是两个人加上我。今天晚上又有两个人辞工了，因为我们厂不是去年的工资没有发嘛，一直拖到今年，应该有两两三个月吧，干了大半年在这里，应该有个一万多块钱工资，然后就是一分钱没没拿到现在。打工人可太难了，从中介进厂的话，还要车费与介绍费啊。好多年前都不要介绍费了，没想到今年又要了。我在苏州找了七天的工作都没找到呀，实在是扛不住了呀，借了三千块钱到湖州跑外卖。可是我在商城里面等单，五高峰啊，等了半天一单都没有，一天挣的还不到一百呀。现在疫情好转了，好多人上街都不戴口罩了。不过没想到的是，工作又变得这么难找了。On July the second, a popular Chinese news Twitter blogger Wai Yu Tojelei, with over one million followers, published a post by another netizen. On July first, a Weibo blogger released on an on-site video at the Mao Jia Bao labor market in Beijing, where a worker described the current difficulties faced by workers. A large number of workers are gathering near Mao Jia Bao in Beijing, looking for work opportunities. Currently, it's a case of more workers, fewer jobs. Jobs are 12-hour workdays for only 160 yuan. Yet there are still countless applicants for these positions, ready to work wherever they're paid. It's very difficult for people over 40 to find a job. Many can't even afford a 20 yuan dormitory bed for the night. Instead, they sleep in public parks and on the street, causing the price of dormitories to plummet. 现在才一百六啊！对啊，十二个小时一百六，早起。早起，我看那一个人，那一个人得了仨人使啊！在这市场把你当做人，去了把你这个人当做一台机器使，让连喝口水的时间都没有。没连连个上卫卫生间地方，直接就没有。限制你十分钟，十分钟走个走个连轨都不够。就算有活儿，这市场上就算有活儿，让你去干一天回来，在床上最少要躺三天。冬天做肠胃的，现在晚上都在大街上睡着了。以前的时候，肠胃高铺是呃二十五，低铺三十。现在高铺是十五块钱，低铺二十块钱都没人坐。天天都在群里面发着了，肠胃降价了，肠胃降价了。天天在家是发着的，但是现在做肠胃的人少了。Okay. 往年的时候，你送个只送个五三个晚餐，一个月轻轻松松挣一万块钱。今年一天累死累活的，从早上四五点起走起来，送午餐、送晚餐、送午餐，一日三餐都送，然后一个月下来，从此挣六七千。但你在这北京打工，只要年龄四十岁以上，你过人家管你就叫老人，年龄就大了。咱们干在酒店里面，人家年龄最最人家最高限制四十岁以下，还得你要人的形象面相，都得要站上。人家要是看见你们顺眼，人家都不要。对吧？一天有时候吃一餐，晚上睡大街。<笑> In response to this, Radio Free Asia consulted local labor brokers who revealed it's not just that workers can't find jobs, the labor market itself is saturated. Recently, a story has been circulating online in China about a private enterprise manager who earned an annual salary of 800,000 yuan but faced numerous obstacles when looking for work after losing his job at 45 years old. He ended up becoming a one-to-one -one courier, earning only 18 yuan per hour, which has sparked widespread resonance and discussion. The Sohu public account Polar Day Studio recently published an article titled "When a 45-year-old middle-aged man looks for work again," focusing on 45-year-old Wei Pen. Ten years ago, Wei was the regional manager of a household goods company in southern China. 
At that time, Wei's annual salary was as high as a hundred thousand yuan, and he had a house, a car, and over a hundred people reporting into him. This year, after losing his job, Wei, now forty-five, has been unable to find full-time work, having failed to secure part-time jobs at chain stores like KFC, Pizza Hut, IKEA, and Starbucks. It was at this point that he began to understand that he had crossed the employment red line at forty-five. A line internally drawn by many Chinese enterprises, and was experiencing age discrimination. After the article was published, it not only resonated with many middle-aged men and women, but many online commentators also began their comments with, "What can a 45-year-old do?" They straightforwardly pointed out that the number of the middle-aged unemployed in China is growing, a problem that is no less serious than the much-hyped issue of youth unemployment. Moreover, the impact of middle-age unemployment on society and the country is significantly greater than that of youth unemployment. According to a survey conducted by the Industrial Research Center under the Beijing Taijing Magazine in 2022, more than 1.94 million enterprises were deregistered in China's 40 richest cities, accounting for about 7% of the total. According to statistics from Professor Zheng Yuhuang of Tsinghua University, in the first half of 2022, 460,000 companies in China went bankrupt, and about 3.1 million businesses were deregistered. On June 15th, data released by China's National Bureau of Statistics showed that the National Urban Surveyed Unemployment Rate in May was 5.2 percent, the same as the previous month. Among them, the unemployment rate for the 16 to 24 year old labor force was 20.8 percent. This data has also sparked widespread questioning among experts and scholars. On June the first, Wang Mingyuan, a researcher at the Beijing Institute for Reform and Development, published an analysis on WeChat titled "How Many Young People Are Unemployed." He argued. That current unemployment statistics in China are inaccurate due to three main problems. Firstly, China's official employment standards are too low. The International Labour Organization standard for employment is 10 hours of work per week. The United States set it at 15 hours, and France at 20 hours. However, China has set the standard at one hour per week. Secondly. Even though China's official statistics include rural household registration in the urban unemployment rate, data bias occurs because migrant workers who lose their jobs in the city return to the countryside due to the high cost of living. Lastly, China currently has as many as 200 million flexibly employed individuals, accounting for about 40 percent of the urban workforce. However, this group's social security participation rate is less than 20 percent, making it difficult to accurately capture their true employment situation through unemployment insurance and registration indicators. China is currently not only facing unemployment challenges, but the employment situation is also not optimistic. According to the latest data released by China's Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security. The number of college graduates in China will reach a record 11.58 million in 2023. The article also pointed out that conservatively estimated, the number of unemployed young people in China has increased by approximately 25 to 30 million since before the pandemic, equivalent to 6.2 to 7.5 percent of the total labor force in this age group. And 2.8 percent to 3.4 percent of the entire working age population. China's unemployment wave is rapidly approaching. Friends in China, are you really prepared? Long-standing structural imbalances in the Chinese economy, high debt-driven infrastructure construction for high-speed GDP growth, local government's heavy reliance on land revenue, a large number of foreign enterprises' withdrawal due to international political risks. And a continued decline in export trade volumes are all contributing factors. These underlying issues have finally erupted following the world's most stringent three-year pandemic prevention policy implemented by the Chinese government, leading to a burst after a short rebound. In the first quarter, China's economy, having emerged from the pandemic, welcomed an unexpectedly robust spring. 
According to the economic data for the first quarter of 2023 released by the National Bureau of Statistics of China on April the 18th, the GDP was 28.5 trillion yuan, an increase of 4.5% year on year. Retail sales were 11.5 trillion yuan, an increase of 5.8% year on year. Despite these glowing figures, there is widespread skepticism outside China given the government's tendency to beautify data. In the second quarter, significant and consistent declines were seen in major economic indicators, all of which fell far short of outside growth predictions. On June the 7th, data released by China's General Administration of Customs showed that exports for the month of May measured in US dollars were 283.5 billion, a decrease of 7.5% compared to the previous year. Imports were 217.69 billion, a decrease of 4.5%. On June the 15th, economic data for May released by China's National Bureau of Statistics revealed a continuation of the decline observed in April. Retail sales, a key indicator of consumer confidence, increased by 12.7%, below the expected growth of 13.6%, and significantly below the 18.4% growth seen in April. Real estate investment saw its fastest decline since at least 2001, dropping 21.5% year-on-year. Private fixed asset investment fell by 0.1% between January and May, contrasting sharply with the 8.4% increase in state-owned entities' investment, suggesting weakening corporate confidence. Following the release of these figures, Nomura analysts stated in the research report, the post-COVID-19 recovery appears to have ended, and a double-bottom economic pattern seems almost certain. We now see significant downside risks to our below-market consensus GDP growth estimates for 2023 and 2024 of 5.5% and 4.2% respectively. Gerwell Bell, lead economist for Asia at PGIM Fixed Income, told the Wall Street Journal that while consumer spending in China initially drove the recovery in the first quarter of 2023, it won't be strong enough to push GDP growth to 5% or 6%. PGIM's data show that the rebound in actual retail activity has stalled and remains far below pre-2020 levels, contrasting sharply with the recovery in the United States. The overall viewpoint of economic prosperity following China's reopening is flawed, Bell said. We need to dispute the viewpoint that consumer spending can be relied upon to drive the economic recovery. We never believe that. Marco Papik, chief strategist at investment management company Clocktower Group, said that dynamic zero-COVID policy has led investors to believe that China's biggest problem is its pandemic prevention policy, completely diverting their attention from this chronic issue. He said that the dynamic zero-COVID policy is like an acute disease, while China's chronic disease is its high household leverage ratio. This is the root cause of the demand problem. Wu Xiaobo, dubbed China's most profitable financial writer, also recently posted on Weibo that only by saving the real estate market can domestic demand be revived. He called on the authorities to promptly make specific arrangements concerning real estate tax and property expiration issues. In multiple articles, he expressed pessimism about China's economic prospects. However, his articles were quickly taken down and his Weibo account was silenced. Official reports from Weibo said that Wu Xiaobo and two other influencers had spread harmful information about the unemployment rate and smeared the development of the securities market. They had also published content attacking and denying current policies and management systems in violation of relevant laws and regulations. Despite this, it seems the Beijing authorities have acknowledged the economic challenges China is facing. In an effort to stimulate the economy, the central bank lowered the one-year and five-year benchmark interest rates on June 20th. Prior to this, six major state-owned banks simultaneously reduced their deposit rates, providing greater profit margins for banks. Concurrently, the central bank has been running its printing presses non-stop, with Voice of America reporting on June 24th that experts revealed the amount of currency being printed each month in tens of trillions of yen has reached a historical high. However, market responses to these measures have been lukewarm at best. 
The Chinese stock market has not experienced the major rise that was anticipated. Instead, there was a substantial drop. The depreciation of the yuan against the dollar has further intensified, hitting a seven-month low. Some economists suggest that in the face of weakened overseas demand, the Chinese government is attempting to stimulate domestic consumption to drive economic growth. But the current situation is such that the government lacks funds, businesses are strapped for cash, and although consumers have some savings in banks, they are hesitant to tap into these reserves due to the bleak overall environment. Therefore, stimulating consumption seems to be an unfeasible strategy. In a recent article, the Wall Street Journal quoted Katrina L, a senior Asia Pacific economist at Moody's Analytics, as saying, "It's hard to be positive about China's economy at the moment." Wall Street banks have already lowered their forecast for China's economic growth in 2023 from a previous 6% to between 5.1% and 5.7%. Finally, let us end with a quote from an article titled "Opinion: China's Money Line: We Can't Go Back: An Analysis of Quarter One 2023 Economic Data," published by Radio Free Asia on April the 25th. The past three grilling years, which feel like a bad dream that never happened, seem to be over. Chinese cities have regained their past hustle and bustle, with people who've been pent up starting to venture outside their homes and even the country. To experience the belated spring, the quarter one 2023 data is also impressively bright, achieving a growth of 4.5 percent, significantly surpassing expectations. Considering the near stagnation of national economic activities in the last few quarters of the previous year due to strict pandemic prevention measures, achieving a GDP growth target of 5 percent doesn't seem to be much of a stretch. No wonder various experts, each with their own agendas, have already begun to look forward to a revenge growth future. But is this really the case? It's probably not that simple. Many have already realized we can never go back to the way things were.